Welcome to presentation number 22 in our series, Rereading Revelation. We are now entering the home stretch of this book, and we are going to do six images from the ending of the book that are particularly helpful to understand that Revelation brings to view a vision of healing. So <clears throat> these images, you can see them here, Revelation and the name, Revelation and the tears, Revelation and the earth, Revelation and the city, Revelation and the nations, and Revelation and time. So onward to Revelation's vision of healing, not to say that we have not been on the road the whole time, the whole series so far, but <clears throat> now this will be focused more. And <clears throat> then we are going to prioritize these images in a certain way and say <clears throat> that the name is the controlling image, that it, the, the center is the name, the revelation of the name, not time, not tears, although they are important, or earth, or city, or nations, all of them are important, but it is the name that is at the center, and we can do it with pictures, too, <coughs> tears, earth, city, nations, and time, and still the name at the center. And now, the competition for this way of prioritizing is time that Revelation is primarily about history and time-centered, and not name-centered, meaning that God is the main subject. That's the difference. And you can try it out this way, putting time at the center and the name out there. It doesn't work. It really doesn't work. Important as those other elements may be, it's going to be hard to dislodge time, uh, the name as the center uh, of, of this book. <clears throat> we are going to be reading a few verses from Revelation chapter 19 for this, uh, and I will read through the passage first, comment on some things and give some illustrations, and then we will <clears throat> do some perspective uh, as we uh, get a little further into it. <clears throat> so let us read. And I saw the heaven opened. And look, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and Trustworthy, and by upright means he makes decisions and wages war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name that no one knows but him. That's the key sentence. <coughs> And he is dressed in clothing dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And I have this illustration from the Welcome connection, uh, Collection here with the rider on the white horse and uh, his clothing that is blood-stained. That's what we are seeing. <clears throat> and the armies of heaven, of, uh, in the heaven, followed him on white horses clothed in fine linen, white and pure. And so we have here, this rider has company, the armies of heaven. Let's see, now I need to get this back like this. And here are the armies of heaven that follow him. And then from his sword goes forth, no, from his mouth goes forth a sharp sword in order by it to strike the nations. And sure enough, they have not made it very subtle, the sword that comes out of the rider's mouth. So these are details in our picture, and we should keep those in mind. And we read on. And he will shepherd them with a rod of iron. This is an image from Psalms chapter 2. And then he alone will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And here is an image of grapes being harvested uh, in the ending of Revelation. And on his robe and on his thigh a name is inscribed, 
King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our passage. Now let's do detail work. And the text we want to understand and hone in on is this one. He has a name that no one knows but him. And here is the name tag and the name with uh, question marks there because no one knows the name and knowing the name might just be very important. So in the text here, still in Revelation 19.11, text we have read, we see the heaven opened and we have many images in Revelation about that. Open heaven, open door, open book, open temple, and open books again. So the openness of heaven is a key element here, and we get to see it one or two more times, and we're seeing it here now. And then <coughs> we have uh, <coughs> the rider on the white horse, and then we have to look at Revelation, the white horses in Revelation, and the tendency to adjudicate this or to uh, judge it as though the horse here is the same horse, the same white horse, or the same meaning of the white horse as in the sequence of the seven seals, where the first rider of the first seal is on a white horse. So we need to look at that. So <clears throat> there are some contrasts here, and I have also made a contrast in the way I translate it. A white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and trustworthy. Unlike the rider on the first horse in the, sec in the, in the uh, uh, seven seals, because that horse is not, has, does not have that sort of a rider. And he, this rider, he makes war in a different way, with upright means. He makes decisions and wages war. So just some contrasts here. The rider here has a sword in his mouth. The rider in <coughs> the seal sequence has a bow, a bow, and not a sword. And so the contrast here I am suggesting is the contrast between conquest and witness. The sword is the symbol of witness. And then the one sitting on it, emphasizing that as a contrast, and then the company he keeps. Let's look at some pictures, just to make it easier for us. So here we have a rider on uh, the horse in Revelation 19, and he has a sword, which is the weapon of witness. And the rider here, he has a bow. This is Dürer's uh, illustration, Dürer's Four Horsemen, one of the most famous illustrations of the Book of Revelation period. And you see that he is on a white horse. But Dürer thinks that these are, these are a group and they are up to the same things. And here for our purposes, just the contrast between the bow and the, and the sword. And those are not trivial contrasts. Those are contrasts that uh, are consequential. That's what we're saying. And then <coughs> there is another contrast. <coughs> and uh, yeah, here, you can see it here. I, uh, this is doubling up here. <coughs> and then, <coughs> so, the, uh, the, uh, these are just images to drive home the point that the sword is a key instrument here, and it is the instrument of witness, the testimony of Jesus, the witness of Jesus, the word, verbum Dei, that's what the artist here see him as, and he is called the word of God. So, And the same thing here, you don't see a sword here, but you see his influence, that this is a <coughs> word, the, the, that he fights by means of revelation. That's what it means. <coughs> so then we read <coughs> that the armies of heaven wearing fine lin lin linen, white and pure, followed him on white horses. So here we had those horses that follow him. 
And then if we see, as we th I think we should see, that the four horses and the four horsemen in the seal sequence are actually a composite. They are up to the same thing. You see the fourth horse kind of summarizes what the previous horses have been up to. I looked and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hades followed with him. Someone is following in these two scenes and here are the armies of heaven on, on white horses here. And here is a ter terrifying demonic reality that follows these horses. These are striking contrasts. This is not exactly the same. And it is easier for us with these images to see the, these contrasts and not, <coughs> not simply say, well, it must be the same thing. It's a white horse, it must be good. Even though, as we said when we did that, uh, that topic, that if you give <coughs> the evil one a choice of horses, he says, thank you, I'll take the white one. That's what <coughs> we have to think. So don't uh, get offended that we uh, are pu pursuing it this way. <coughs> he has a name that no one knows but him. And he is dressed in clothing dipped in blood. And his name is called the Revealer of God. And here the, <coughs> the uh, uh, Logos to Theo, uh, the Word of God. I have said that the Word of God is a revealing word. So the name of the writer is the one who reveals God to us. Very similar. And the expression is actually identical to the expression in the Gospel of John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Revealer, and the Revealer was with God, and the Revealer was God. Similar here, and I wish I could win the discussion for that translation of the Word of God, the Logos to Theo, in the context of the Gospel of John and in the context of the Book of Revelation. But his clothing, he is dressed in clothing dipped in blood. And now for one option that I prefer and then another one that I will discuss a little bit <coughs> for what to think here. So clothing dripped, uh, dipped in blood, what's that? Is it his own blood? Could it be the blood of someone else? Which one is it? Well, I think it is clearly his own blood and that the image that we should keep in mind or the Old Testament passage is the story of Joseph when his brothers come to the father Jacob and, he, and they tell him, we found this, you know, this garment that, Joseph, that Jacob had given Joseph. It was a very special piece of clothing. And, you know, we found this. It's bloody, you know. And they had, of course, arranged something. Instead of killing him, they had sold him. But it was, in their mind, just it was a close call. And they show it to the father, and he is totally devastated when he sees it. Let's read the passage in the Old Testament. Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had a long robe with sleeves taken to their father. And they said, this is what we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. Pretty nasty stuff that those brothers did. And the shock of the father, the shock, the trauma to him, over this. <clears throat> so, so here we have a very powerful image from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis, to under, to in support of the notion that the robe dipped in blood is the blood of the rider on the horse. It is the blood of the victim, the rider as victim, as self-sacrificing victim. 
But then someone might say, well, you are leaving something out. You're, you have another text. Shouldn't you look at that text? There is some similarities with another text. It's an Isaiah chapter 63 verses 1 through 6. And <clears throat> could that also influence uh, our passage in Revelation? And the answer is yes, provided we don't overread it, provided we think it through in a careful manner. Who is this that comes from Edom, from Bozra, in garments stained crimson? Who is this so splendidly robed, marching in his great might? There's a, a dialogue going on here. It is I, announcing vindication, mighty to save. Why are your robes red? and your garments like theirs who tread the winepress. Notice he will tread the winepress in Revelation 19. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their juice splattered on my garments and stained all my robes, for the day of vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redeeming work had come. So here we see a, a, an act of what is actually a, an act of deliverance. God stepping up and fighting for people to set them free, fighting for the oppressed to set them free. But it surely sounds like he is using violence to accomplish it. And that, that this could then be a, a reason why some interpreters think that, <coughs> yes, in Revelation, Jesus sheds his own blood. He is a victim of violence. <laughs> but then he turns around and becomes a perpetrator of violence. And these passages, or this passage in particular, has been used to that effect. So here we have... Uh, this image again from, uh, from the Welcome Collection. We have the rider on the white horse and we have the wine press and treading the vi wine press here. Those are, that image is connected and you have to marvel at what these artists did hundreds and hundreds of years ago. <coughs> so uh, there is the wine press. But let's, <coughs> before we rush to any conclusion, let's look at what, which image is it that is focused, or which, in Isaiah's text, what is it he emphasizes the most? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I looked, but there was no helper. I stared, but there was no one to sustain me. So my own arm brought me victory, and my wrath sustained me. I trampled down peoples in my angers, I crushed them in my wrath, and I poured their life blood, blood on the earth. Let there be no mistaking here. This warrior wins the war. He defeats the enemy. He succeeds in subduing the opposition, as it were. But does he do it with violence? Even in the context of Isaiah, in the context of the story of Jesus, does he do anything with violence? That is doubtful. But even in the context of the story on, of, uh, in Isaiah, is it violence? Or is the emphasis that he has to do it alone? He has to do it alone. It is the aloneness of this battle that is the most striking. I have trodden the winepress alone. I looked, but there was no helper. I stared, but there was no one to sustain me. Let me suggest that if violence had been his method, he would not have had to do it alone. There would have been plenty of support for violence. In fact, in the life of Jesus, as he heads, he heads to or as they come to arrest him, there is someone who is willing to defend him and he pulls a sword, isn't it Peter? And he cuts off the, the ear of one of the servants and Jesus says, put your sword back. 
we're not going to fight this by violent means. So we have <coughs> caveats, we have sort of constraints on Jesus fighting <coughs> it violently. If he had wanted to do it by violence, he would have had the help of the disciples and of the zealots and of the Maccabees and of the Emperor Constantine who thought that he would win victory for God by this sign you will conquer. So there is a sort of intuition. <laughs> this is intuitively quite difficult to think that violence is his method. But aloneness, doing it alone, well that is central in this story, how he goes about it. And I will show a few texts from the Gospels. <clears throat> here in Mark's story of the suffering of Jesus, and here we are, uh, here is a picture from Gethsemane, and trees are old, some of them may be as close, close to 2,000 years old, these trees in the garden. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death, remain here and keep awake. I don't want to be alone. That's what he's saying. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you are all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Not yet, not what I want, but what you want. This person is going into battle. He is going to defeat an enemy. And he is troubled by it. This is a big, big fight that he is going into. And he doesn't want to do it alone. This is the thing. He came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake for one hour? He doesn't want to be alone. And once more he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and he did not, they did not know what to say to him more alone. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? And then they come to arrest him. And all of them deserted him and fled. Isaiah was not exaggerating when he said, <coughs> I had to do it alone. Isaiah was not exaggerating when he said, I looked around to see if anyone would help me. And even the closest wouldn't do it. But that is not because he does it violently. He doesn't do it violently, and that is partly part of the reason why he is so alone. And here we have an illustration from the time, uh, from the 15th century, where the soldiers are coming here, and Jesus is praying, and the disciples are sleeping, and my, he is alone. Now let's look <coughs> at the... <clears throat> and I found this other illustration. Let me show you that, show that too. Uh, this is <clears throat> the, in a church in uh, Norway, in Dombos in Norway. Someone has actually uh, put this church on fire and destroyed these amazing paintings. But I was really impressed with this one here, where Jesus is praying, and the sort of aloneness of that figure is so striking. So I think we have good evidence for this. <coughs> I have one more uh, thing from the Gospels I want to show, and this is <coughs> from the Gospel of John, where Jesus again, and it's clearer on <laughs> where, how does Jesus win the war over the forces of evil? Here he says, my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, he will not say that. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. And then he says, now is the critical moment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be expelled. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. I will win this war. I am going to expel or to overcome the opposition, the bad side. And I will do it all alone, but <clears throat> it will not be by violence. It will be as a victim of violence and not as a perpetrator of violence. That is the key. This painting is by a Norwegian painter, Henrik Sørensen. And, and Jesus is here 
fighting and clinging to an angelic figure that comes to support him, succor him. And you see these claws coming up here in the painting. This is one of the most amazing illustrations I have seen. These claws coming up, clawing at him, because there is a real battle, and he is going to win this battle the hard way and not the easy way. So <coughs> let's <coughs> look at one illustration here. <coughs> it says, we have a saying, there are two sides to the same coin. And you might just say, well, <coughs> one side is that he is a victim of violence, and one other side is that he is a perpetrator of violence. Those are the two sides of the same coin. <coughs> and then let's just look at this coin, and, uh, and I will give you my opinion about it. I think I can stop it here. And there, I stopped it. I can start it again a little and stop it again. No, I have to stop it there. Let's see if I can stop it there. So here is Albrecht Dürer's illustration of the lamb killed with violence inscribed. Now I have inscribed it on a coin. This is, a, <coughs> I was able to make this illustration, see the lamb, see the blood, that he is here a victim of violence. And here on the other side of the coin, let's look at it. Here is the other side of the coin. Here <coughs> is the welcome illustration, the rider on the white horse with his robe dipped in blood. The two sides of the coin, the two sides of the coin has the same message. He is a victim of violence on both sides of the coin. There is not two sides to him, even though there are two images in Revelation here for, he, for this, the scene in Revelation 5 and the scene in Revelation 19, and both places he is a victim of violence. And that is how he wins the war. That is co a coherent interpretation. <coughs> so we will <coughs> now go through the, the way Revelation discusses the name and uh, take it from there in just a moment. So in the context of Revelation, we have name sort of different levels of name, and let's just look at them. So we have a kind of general understanding of it where Revelation says, you still have a few names in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. And then we have in Revelation 11:13, uh, at that moment there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell, 7,000 names uh, were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were in awe and spoke well of the God of heaven. So here we have name. The, wor the, the word in Greek is onom onomata, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's just person. It doesn't mean anything. It, we could have said you have a few people. You could have said here you have 7,000 people. Name is person, people. That's the general. Then we have a hybrid uh, meaning that is a little deeper, maybe, and <clears throat> this is in the Gospel of John and one from Revelation, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name. Again, that is a way of speech in the Bible. And then this one, I know that you have but little power and that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And we could have said here, many believed in him. We could have said here, many believed in him. And we could have said, you have not denied me. You know, that would have been fine. But there is a kind of hybrid texture to this. The name means a person, but it also means a characteristic. It also means that you have accepted this person and what that person represents. So it is a little more than that. And then we get to the hard part in our text. He has a name that no one knows but him. And name here must mean something more 
Name here means essence, character, conduct. Name is what it's all about. What he is like, what he does. That's what name means. And so we wonder, we have some questions or observations. No one knows the name. It's a name that no one knows. If we get to know it, it will be up to the one whose name it is. He has to reveal it to us. That's the only way we'll get to know it. <laughs> Do we get to know it? That's the point. We're sitting here, big question marks, all of us. <clears throat> and then the plot thickens in Revelation. Because the name has been subjected to a smear campaign. There has been misrepresentation of the name. There has been slander of the name. The dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is the slanderer and the antagonist. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on its heads were slanderous names, names aiming to misrepresent the other side. Here I have used the translation, the mudslinger. The mudslinger, the one who <coughs> throws mud at another person and tries to destroy that person's reputation. And here, this one, it opened its mouth to slander God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. So now the importance of the name is getting bigger and bigger because not only is it a name, not only is the problem a name that we don't know, but it is the problem of a, someone who has been slandered, whose name has been sort of dragged in the mud. That is what we are dealing with here, slander as misrepresentation of the name. And here inside this, this wall of misrepresentation, inside this wall of, of slander, is the name. Can we get to it? And our text, <coughs> the sort of background story for this slandering the name, begins <coughs> in Genesis in some ways, in other uh, books, in Isaiah, Ezekiel. It might begin even before this uh, creation story. But when the serpent speaks in Genesis, he says that there is a generosity deficit in God God is not a giving person. And he says that there is a freedom deficit. God is more interested in restriction than in freedom. He slanders the name. He makes them. He has made us think something about God that may not be true. So <coughs> the opponent is named in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is very forceful in the terms it uses for the name of the character of the opponent. There is the star that has fallen from heaven. The name of the star is Wormwood, poison. A third of the waters became Wormwood, uh, poisoned. And many died from the water because it was made bitter. And here... Uh, again, the star that fell from heaven in the fifth trumpet, they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. So naming the opposing side is a project in the book of Revelation and taking away whatever prestige this figure might have. Wormwood, poison, destroyer, darkness, those, uh, that's the portfolio of his name. <clears throat> so let's go back to our table here and think again. No one knows the name. And the name is in trouble because it has been slandered. If we get to know it, it will be up to the one whose name it is. And then the name was slandered. We get to know the name of the one who slandered him. Do we get to know the name of the one who was slandered? <clears throat> Let's look. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name 
and his father's name written on their foreheads. It must have worked. There must have been some success in transmitting the name because here the name has now become a part of those people who stand on Mount Zion. And this amazing text in Revelation 22, 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Let's look at it this way. The name has been revealed. It must have been. The name has been inscribed and the name must be known for such descriptions to make sense, such claims uh, to make sense. And then <coughs> we have this text here in uh, the message to the church, uh, the believing community in Philadelphia. To everyone who prevails in the war, I will make him and her a pillar in the temple of oh my God, you will not go out to the outside anymore. You will not go out to fight for one thing. And I will write on him and her the name of oh my God and the name of the city of oh my God, the new Jerusalem that is coming down from heaven from my God and my name, the new one. So here the name is revealed, inscribed and known the new name is the name renewed. It is the name that has been reclaimed in the sense that the slander was defeated. And when I wrote my dissertation on the book of Revelation at the University of St. Andrews, the title of my dissertation is Saving God's Reputation, Clearing the Name. That's the mission of that book. So that's big, a big topic in, in the book. The threefold mention of name here, of God, of the city, and my name, is a resounding confirmation of the importance of the name. In this. So if we go now from the promise to the church in Philadelphia, where the name is such a big thing in the promise to those believers, we are ready to look at this one that there are two names in, in Revelation that no one knows. We have studied this now in some depth, his name, that he has a name that, that no one knows but him, and he is eager to reveal it. And then we have in the message to the believers in Pergamum, we have the believer's name as also uh, also getting a new name to everyone who prevails in the war. I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give a white stone. And on the white stone is written a name that no one knows except the one who receives it. A name that no one knows. Here, his name. A name that no one knows. The believer's name. These are strange thoughts, strange, strange uh, 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 expressions. And, and we have now already also seen that the name, his name, is going to in some ways make the transition to be internalized uh, in the life of the believers. So the new name that no one knows on the side of, believer, of the believer must have something to do with his name. Those that is not, they are not sort of independent of each other. Uh, so <coughs> maybe we can look at it like this <coughs> and put together the promise here to Pergamum and the promise here to Philadelphia. My name, the new one. My name, the renewed one. The one that is made right and has been revealed. And then uh, here is the stone <laughs> then that uh, <coughs> that is the gift here i will give him a white stone and on the white stone is written a new name and here here we have we have that name uh, written there and i don't need to circle it it is <coughs> quite clear so let's see if we can add this up <coughs> and let's see if it works to put it this way we get to know the name we get to know the name. It is the writer's mission to reveal it. And 
Here we can see these people now with question marks. I should have removed those question marks. It isn't anymore an issue. You get to know the name if one wishes to know it. And this is the mission of the rider. His, his, uh, uh, his, uh, his, uh, uh, the rider's name has been obscured and we are ignorant of the name and we may even have extremely wrong ideas about the name and what God is like and what the rider on the white horse is like. So to clear up whatever confusion there may be is very important. So we get to know the name. <coughs> and then this one, that the robe dipped in blood and the lamb killed with violence are mutually reinforcing images that defines the name. They are two sides of the same coin and the two sides of, this, of the coin have the same message. Now, the risk of reading this some other way, say that the rider on the white horse is a perpetrator of violence, that actually risks neutralizing the tremendous discovery we made in chapter, in chapter 5, where the lamb that is a victim of violence is the one who explains God. So he is a self-giving person when he has the robe dipped in blood and when he is the lamb killed with violence. And that is his name. That is deeply related to his name. There is an irreducible subjectivity in the revelation and transmission of the name. He wants to deliver us to us in person. And when he delivers it to us in person, he also wants to give us the new name, our new name in person, to redefine us, to refine us more along the lines of the name that he is what he is like. That is true too. And then, this is easy. To convey knowledge of the name is in this book more important than knowledge of history. We do not need to be shy of saying that. And we should now take away our question marks. I apologize for them. I will cross them out like this. No more question marks. He did succeed in revealing to us his name. There is a song by Leonard Cohen that I think fits this. The word is, the, because we are reading Revelation, trying to rediscover its vision of healing. And Re Cohen's song has, is, a, is a song about healing, come healing. And there is a verse in the song saying, come healing of the name. I'd like to read the song. I will do it with illustrations from a performance by Leonard Cohen and his singers in Dublin. <coughs> and this one is easy to find on YouTube. You can find the Cohen performance of the song. <coughs> oh, gather up the brokenness and bring it to me now. The fragrance of those promises you never dared to vow. Everything that was broken, including those things we didn't dare to even think about. Uh, this is a good start. The splinters that you carry, the cross you left behind, come healing of the body, come healing of the mind. And let the heavens hear it, the penitential hymn, come healing of the spirit, come healing of the limb. Brokenness and healing, now in a broad sense, in human experience. Then Cohen adds, this, comes in and joins the singers in his performance, behold the gates of mercy in arbitrary space, and none of us deserving the cruelty or the grace. O solitude of longing where love has been confined, come healing of the body, come healing of the mind. And then Something, some light is lit here. Some things happen to make the light come back. Oh, see the darkness yielding that tore the light apart. Come healing of the reason. 
from healing of the heart. And then in Cohen's performance here in Dublin, just to show us what is the most important part of the song, he adopts a kneeling posture. He goes down, and you can see him here kneeling. Oh, trouble dust concealing and undivided love, the heart beneath is teaching to the broken heart above. And then comes the big one. Oh, let the heavens falter and let the earth proclaim. Come healing of the altar, come healing of the name. And here you can see our man, the performer, is in a praying posture. He knows this is, that this is the most important part. And then his singers take it home. <clears throat> o longing of the branches to lift the little bud. O longing of the arteries to purify the blood. And let the heavens hear it, the penitential hymn. Come healing of the spirit, come healing of the limb. And that is repeated uh, once more time. I'd like us to hear the song. We're not going to hear the song by Cohen. We're going to hear it performed by a Norwegian singer by the name of Solveig Slettajel. And she will have some singers with her. And we are using her version because she has also figured out which part of the song is the most important.
There is much in our lives that is in need of healing and the song gets it right. And the song also gets it right and our performer gets it right that nothing is more in need of healing than the name. Oh, let the heavens falter and let the earth proclaim come healing of the altar, come healing of the name.